on the topic of um, African ownership, <laughs> there has been a debate that has been sparked a couple of weeks ago in terms of African wax print. So Ooh. for me, that... <laughs> Linda said you called. You called. <laughs> People are actually saying that African wax print has less of a connection with African culture and more of a connection with colonization. So mm. now that there has been such an encouragement for everyone to shop black and support black businesses, whether you're a black person or, um, or an ally to the black community, um, we should be looking at, you know, buying buying black owned things and we're only now just realizing that even things that we think are black owned yeah. are not so yeah. what do you guys think about still buying wax prints and things like that even if they were created in different countries and um, manufactured in different countries and the money kind of never circles back to the continent do you think you're still supporting the black community by doing that this one ugh, this one's a bit of a hard one for me um mm. and i'll say it's hard i'm gonna be like wildly transparent you know, I only, I'd say, recently knew what an African wax print was. And it's not because I haven't seen the prints before. <laughs> it's not because I haven't seen the prints before. I just didn't know what they were called. So it was like, oh, okay, okay, okay this is what they're called. And I did a little bit of research into it because, as I said, I wasn't wildly familiar. Um, but I saw that there were some manufacturing companies on, like, in like the mainland, like GTP and, and Woodin and things like that, but that they were owned by a group in the Netherlands called the Blisco Group. And then the Blisco Group, were then acquired by a UK company for 151 million. And of course, none of the ladies in West Africa or the markets who ever sold it never got any kind of money from the shares. But they apparently, the Blisco group, what they do is they go to the women in the market and they sit with them and figure out like what the latest trends are and what the buying state is and who's buying and when they're buying and what they're buying so they can go back and, and make all the prints. And I thought, wow, they're just taking so much so much from the land it's actually horrific because it's not benefiting the person the thing about african material is that it's more than just wax print hmm. you have things like kente which is ghanaian you have astroke which is nigerian yoga ibo whatnot you have i don't want to speak on other countries but i don't know every single country there is in africa but you understand <laughs> what i mean there are there are traditional african materials that are traditionally made in africa the issue is that because they might not necessarily have enough finance, they're not able to then export and have those materials bought here in the UK. So companies like the companies Anissa mentioned, they do go there, they do their research, they, they try and buy. I'm thinking I've got a wax print to show you guys because even this dashiki that I'm wearing, I won't lie to you, this dashiki, I did buy it in a Nigerian shop, mm. but whether or not it was actually manufactured by a Nigerian company, I probably don't think it was, you know, but yeah. things like that, she can, I don't even think are really African. They're just part of the African craze, you know, yes. and that's how I think of wax print. When I think of the real material that my mum be wearing, like George's and Boba and Hollandes, when she starts naming me things like that, I'm like, yes, those are very, very Nigerian. But when I think of wax prints and I think of that she can, I just think of that fake kind of Africa that everyone wants to celebrate. I want to be part of that ain't really rooted anywhere, you know, but I think for me, when I buy materials that are, you know, traditionally African, I do buy them from someone who looks like me. And I think the short-term benefit is that my money goes to them. The long-term yeah. could be that if they get enough business, they might now be able to go and create their own manufacturing company. They may now be able to make this themselves and start actually taking over where some of these companies are coming from. So I think the short-term support can actually lead to long-term support as well. Because unfortunately, Rome wasn't built in a day. So I will still continue to buy. Don't get twisted. I'm one of those bricks tonight that you guys spoke about that were having those um, raves. That I did not go to, by the way. I did not go to any of those raves. But, some people <laughs> I knew. but you know, I, there, there are um, Asian men in 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 Brixton that sell um, material. And I won't lie, I kind of intentionally don't go there. You know, I want to go to my auntie's shop. You know, when I say my aunt, I don't even mean my relative. I mean a black woman shop to buy these things from. So I think the short-term support can actually yield long-term benefits. Mm. Because, like, I was reading an article or a link to an article on Instagram just this morning, and it was talking about how, and um, it was talking about colonialization and how that affected an industrial re revolution happening in the continent of Africa. Mm. And I think we see that now where a lot of things aren't manufactured within the country. 
mm-hmm. even though they benefit. So you have countries like you were saying, um, Anissa, in like China, who will make print because we know everything's made in China. Like their industrial system is is the best, one of the best in the world. They can make things so cheaply and then they're shipping it back to these countries. And I saw that there was actually a manufacturing company in Ghana that was making print, but they were saying they were getting heavily undercut mm-hmm. by other people who are importing because they can do it for cheaper. Mm-hmm. And that's where we think it's affecting the economy because it, it helps the woman in the shop who's selling it. But obviously we're talking about the major profits aren't going to them. And even though it is something from colonialization, as like you said, I didn't know this either. And I have a lot of African prints. I've traveled around the continent for work and my other job, apart from this. <laughs> so <laughs> traveling around the continent, and I always try to buy some local print because for me, it's always made me feel centered in the culture and feel like, do you know what? I am a displaced person from this continent. And I don't think, for me, I can only say this as a Caribbean person, it's not about me stopping wearing print because I think print is now so heavily integrated within African culture to say that I'm not going to wear it because it's colonialization. I'm like, I don't even think you can, you can separate it now. It's so ingrained. It's so, and I was reading something that said like the print tells stories and yes. some of the has talk about things that have happened in the culture, the way society has moved on. Like it tells a story. But for me, it's about trying to get the money back into the country now. Yes. Um, and I feel like we're still seeing a continental rape of Africa. Like we're seeing a cultural rape 100%. of Africa still. Like we're talking about when slavery happened, you know, they were stealing like the gold and the metals and the ore and all of that. But I went to Swaziland, which is a country in South Africa, mm-hmm. literally right next to South Africa, Swaziland, a small little place. And I we, we, we were going to a safari park and one of our people on our team who was born in the country, he was showing us a place where they're I think it was taking copper. I think they, they have like a lot of copper ore. And I was just like, that was so great. Like people can find work. He was like, not really. He was like, the king of Swaziland has a deal with the Chinese people. So he'll oh. take the first cut and then China will take the rest. And China send over workers to mm-hmm. work in there so they won't even hire local. He was like, it actually has no benefit to our country whatsoever. And for the local people, apart from the king. And stuff like that is where I think the change needs to be happening in terms of you should not be allowed to come and put things in our country that doesn't benefit us. Like you're trying to literally, you don't even wear these prints in China. You don't wear it in in Asia. You don't wear it. So you should not be using it just to make money when it's linked to our culture. Because for me, it's cultural appropriation. Oh, yes. Mm. I think just to give a little bit more context in terms of um, the wax prints being connected to colonialism, the idea is that um, in Indonesia, there was a material called batik, which looks very similar to African wax print, and that the Dutch were inspired because the Dutch had colonies um, in Indonesia at the time, in this specific island that they found the batik material, that they then were inspired to make like an African wax print. And they, um, they had... West African soldiers working for them in those Dutch colonies in Indonesia. And the story is that apparently the African soldiers would have brought back those materials to the land. And that's how African wax print became a part of the culture. But that's just one story. We don't know the whole truth because, yeah. you know, the, well, I think there's an the African proverb that says tales of hunting is always told by the hunter, you know, awesome. like history yeah, yeah. is written by the people who win the wars. Yeah. So we have to take that one with a pinch of salt. But I do think that it's very frustrating when you think that you are um, representing your culture and you think that, you know, you're you're being like, like pro-black with the things that you wear yeah. or the things that you do. And then you realize it has actually, like this, this, the circulation of wealth actually doesn't, reach back to the people that you want it to reach. Like, for example, when I was growing up, I used to use Dark and Lovely shampoo yes. and things like that. And we, like, even as a child, the world that we live in was very, very different then. I never, I can't think of one single person or, like, cartoon or something that I saw on the television that I felt represented by me. So mm. the thing that I would look forward to is washing my hair because on the bottle, there was a little dark skinned black girl who looked like me. And I was like, this is, this is made for me. And that was the, that's the first memory that I have of feeling like something has been created for me yeah. instead of something that I'm using 
despite it being created for someone else, which is the majority of things. So then to grow up and realize that Dark and Lovely is owned by L'Oreal, <laughs> that, was, that was a little bit disheartening, especially because when you are creating things for black women or for the black community, but you have a business mindset, and by that I mean, you don't have the interest of the community in mind. I think the quality of those products are not going to be to the standard that we deserve because what you're thinking about is circulating the wealth going yeah. back to you and going back to your company and going back to your family. So there was even, um, you know, research on black hair products for black women that haven't um, been properly tested because yeah. they didn't care that much about it. And it turns out that there was a lot of damaging chemicals that yeah. could even lead to pro issues with your own brain. Like I'm not even talking about your scalp, guys. Yeah. Oh your brain, God. your mental yeah. health from these chemicals yeah. that you didn't test properly because you don't care about where it's going. You just think we're going to throw it in that shop and black women are going to buy it because they need hair products. Mm -hmm. So things like that really frustrate me because you want to not only buy something that was made with you in mind, but you want to also give money back to the community that is suffering. And it's, it's really ridiculous to see how deep this goes. Yeah. I'm like, even the materials, guys? Yeah, we can't sure. even have the, we can't even have a dashiki like. We but don't even, forget, guys, there are there are various textiles though. There are various yeah. textiles, and, and you are in places like in Africa that are originating in Africa and are woven in Africa. It's just yeah. these yeah. main kind of prints that are yeah, yeah, it's a wax prints. But they, but they, but then I read an article that was saying that they're struggling because of the competition. Because yeah. what, like what I think Sophie was saying about how easy it is to man manufacture in East Asia because you're importing it here or you're creating it here, it's so much cheaper. And as people who are not like ridiculously wealthy, you're going to go for the cheaper products because you're going to try and save money. So like we're going to go for this one because it, we, we can save however, however, many much, um, however much money with this instead. So it's like even the ones that have been created within the continent, like they're struggling to make their business grow because of all but the see, other competition. But that's why what Sophie said in something we were talking about before, reparations, they're essential because, like you said, the industrial economy in, in Africa is, 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 come on, it's, you can't compare it to that of China's. But with reparations, things like that can be fixed and sorted and we can have a fighting chance because, unfortunately, we haven't been given one. Honestly, the only way I can see to actually mend the damage that has been caused to Africa. Yeah, and for me as well, it's not even just, oh, let me, I'll go quick, Anissa, girl. I'm not going to yes, yes, No, because I've just got one quick thing. Go, 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 go. <laughs> I was say for me, and it's not even just about the reparations in terms of the continent of Africa. For me, it's like just leaving them now even to just allow them to grow. And yeah. some places are, like some of the wealthiest people in the world are in Nigeria. So let's not get it twisted like everyone's living in poverty. They are not. There are some very extremely rich, um, rich people. Very in rich. In <laughs> Africa. But very much still Africa is still propping up Europe in certain ways and exporting things. My thing is let them keep their world and then and all the things that they're growing and producing so that they can actually start to make money off of this and not just can, can continue to export it for our benefit. Mm. Yeah, I was just going to say quickly um, that I came across last year a designer. Um, her name is, oh, oh, God, I hope I say it right. Her name is Eze, Eze. Uh, and basically, she's based in the UK, but she makes, she designs her own wax prints and then she prints them up and makes them, um, prints the fabrics and she makes them into head ties and she sells them because I went to like a shop black event for Black History Month. Um, and so she makes her own wraps and things like that. And when we, I was thinking about this topic, I thought, when I was thinking about this question, I was just thinking about Eze because I was thinking to myself, like, I wonder what drove her to make her own wax prints. But I hope that what she's doing or what everybody else will see is that, you know, there can be some sort of reclaiming or ownership over prints.